what show was that you say? So Skin A and E on Channel Five. Okay, I've done it a few seasons now, and they bring in real patients. It's basically okay. Doctor Pimple Popper, and yeah, we just <laughs> cut, cut cut holes in people oh, on wow. TV. So what you're looking for is something that's changing and something that's out of keeping with the rest of your skin. So I always tell my patients, look at your moles. It should look similar to your other moles. If it's the ugly duckling, it's the one that stands out from the crowd. That's the one you need to be more concerned about. So that's- and we cut a hole, therefore, to the size of the cancer. No bigger, no smaller. So your chance of it coming back is zero to none. The, 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 the bottom line is it's been shown that people who've used sunbeds, especially before the age of 35 have a much higher likelihood of getting a melanoma than those who've never used them. The machines are emitting ultraviolet, as that word again, radiation, and they should be highly regulated. But, you know, we don't know what's coming out of those tubes. It's <laughs> cool no, having a tan. I'm like, tan. Smoking used to be cool, but it's not cool anymore. Yeah. And you're not going to start smoking. That is very <laughs> true. Yeah. And okay. I've had a few patients come to see me and, you know, looking good, big muscles, covered in spots, but they're not going to stop the roids. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I can't get rid of those spots. Do you do cry? No. Oh, okay. I'm the most inflexible person you'll ever meet. I had, did do it. I did do karate at med school to try and like improve flexibility. Mm. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was, I was sore. Um, I don't know what type of karate. And I did judo growing up. Yeah. But um, never done anything. Do, else. do you know what jujitsu is like? Like the what it is? No, I'm guessing it's more kind of big movements. Is it more? No. Than, so it's it's grappling, so sort of floor. Oh, is based, it? Yeah, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Floor-based movement. Like. Yeah. If you've dabbled with judo, the from the moment it hits the floor, yeah, that's primarily. Oh, that is jujitsu. Oh, okay. No, I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a sort of submission based bit of uh, savagery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bit of savagery, and it really it's, is. Yeah. It's, it's probably more it's, useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really yeah. is useful. Yeah. yeah, it's it's one of those things. Yeah, and it's because you're not. There's no concussive blows to the head or anything, so it allows you to spar quite hard. Yeah, uh, we've got a high level of intensity without causing any injury. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, we get to I'll have. Be, I'll behave myself. Yeah. No, no I, fine, it, 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 yeah, it turns me daily. With it. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these things. I think it makes us. Uh, it helps us working together so much easier because. You kick the shit out yeah, about three or four times a week. <laughs> yeah. we have a scrap. And yeah. You know, any That's animosity right. if it was ever any. Your bloody say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been good. So yeah, it's all good. Uh, right, I'll do a quick introduction, mate. Yep. A like very brief one, very, very brief. Um, and then uh, we'll just dive straight in, mate. Mm-hmm. Comfy? Yeah. 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 Cool. All right, perfect. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a consultant dermatologist, Dr. Toby Nelson. How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. Good. Thank you for coming on. Um, I know what a dermatologist is, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not sure everybody in our audience will know what you specialize in. So could you quickly explain what it is that you uh, specialize in? Of course, yeah. So dermatologists are doctors who specialize in diseases of the skin, hair, and nails, believe it or not. Um, so we are specialists, so you not GPs. Um, you become a dermatologist initially through going through your junior doctor years, and then you have to become a physician, or a paediatrician, a member of one of those colleges. So that's a few more years. And then you then apply, and if you're successful, you can get into the dermatology residency program. It's another four years. And during that time, you study all the diseases that um, yeah, of the skin, uh, and again, of the hair, hair system, nails, and mucous membranes as well. I forgot to mention that. Bearing in mind, there's tens of thousands of diseases. Most of them we won't ever see in our career. Um, so it's, um, it's a lifelong learning specialism, dermatology. You can't learn it all mm-hmm. in those four years. And then within dermatology, there's subspecialists like myself who then focus on one or two areas. And I focus on the surgical aspect of dermatology is focusing on the management of skin cancer um, so yes there's there's not many of us it takes a long time to become a dermatologist uh, and we've got a very broad church of what we have to look after what we see from babes right through to the end of life mm, wow okay i didn't realize it was so long like how, how long is that like the tra- start to finish tra- training training's around uh depending on how you do it 10 to 12 years from from um leaving med school um, so it's a, it's a black belt in jiu-jitsu right there. I was about to say, that's, that's <laughs> a long time. Yeah, yeah, a long time. Yeah, that's a long time. And uh, where do you currently work? Are you working for the NHS or private practice? Yeah, then? so I work in Plymouth, at University Hospital Plymouth, uh, in the Department of Dermatology there. And I also have a private practice um, in the in the near area as well. Mm. Okay, good stuff. Well, I guess, you know, where as much as you can in Britain, having a bit of a, you know, sort of hot period at the moment. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and a lot of people are thinking about getting a suntan and everything else. And I think this is therefore a really topical conversation to have. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously you specialize in skin cancer. Maybe let's start there. So let's understand exactly what skin cancer is and, and what the different types are, how serious they are yeah. um, and go from there. Yeah, so skin cancer actually is, uh, accounts for a large part of what dermatologists actually do now. Despite learning about all these weird and wonderful diseases, infections of the skin, weird blistering conditions, 60 to 70% of our workload across the UK, especially in the Southwest, because we're in the hotbed of skin cancer down here, is dealing with lumps and bumps, referrals, people with lesions that they're worried about, moles that are changing. And a large part of our day job is seeing, treating skin cancer. It's incredibly common. But there are different types and not all types of skin cancer, if you like, come with a big C. They're not all worrying. The majority are actually very low grade, what I would call indolent. You would never die from them, but they're still classed as a cancer. But they cause a problem nonetheless. They still have to be treated. Uh, so why do we see more down here? Well, we're just more sunshine in the southwest. And we're outdoorsy people. We like being outside. We're near the beaches. We're near the moors. Um, and as a consequence, we get more sun damage on our skins and therefore we get more, we manifest more skin cancers than say if you lived in a, in a city or an urban environment um, where you would see l less of the, of the, uh, the bright light. Mm. Well, there's, there's proof that it's sunny in the Southwest, huh? <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned there's a couple of different types. Can we, can we maybe sort of talk through, I did a little bit of homework yeah. and, and though you've got sort of melanomas and non-melanomas. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And, and can you just maybe sort of explain, I guess, what a melanoma is and, and go from there? So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, so boil it down, there's, the skin can produce lots of different lesions, a bit like your garden can grow lots of different plants and some weeds. And our skin can grow lots of different things on them. Most of the things that appear on our skin are harmless, but some things are not, and those would be what we would call a skin cancer. And the different types of skin cancer could be broadly divided into melanoma, that's the one that's more worrying, but luckily it's not the most common, a non-melanoma skin cancer. Non-melanoma is a whole load of other diagnoses, and those are the vast majority of the skin cancers we see, and those ones we're most at risk of. So we park melanoma just for a second, the non-melanoma ones, the vast majority of things called a basal cell carcinoma, or BCC for short, and a squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC. And there are various other ones that are quite rare, uh, which can also form on the skin, but these tend to be rare and tend to be seen as small pops, small cohort of the population. So if we go back to melanoma. Melanoma, that is a cancer of the melanocyte. So what's a melanocyte? That is a cell in your skin that produces the pigment, that produces our tan. And within our skin, you have melanocytes that behave normally. And when they behave abnormally, and that's usually from damage from sun rays, breaking the DNA within that cell, breaking its its mechanism, if you like, its clockwork, and then it misbehaves and it populates and it grows out of control, and then it will turn into a tumor or a cancer. And then as that grows and grows, that can become a melanoma. Now, a melanoma is where a cancer can then spread from the skin to other parts of your body. And if it's not caught early, it can be fatal. So those are the ones we worry about the most. Yeah, okay. And I don't know how old these statistics are here, but I think, whenever I put this together, it was an old junior assignment mm. around me from years ago. Um, but I think at the time, melanoma was about 16,000 diagnosed each year in the UK. That's, yeah, I mean, it'd be higher now. Those data is usually from sort of like five, 10 years out. Okay. Yeah, so the incidence is only increasing. Right. And then I think non-melanoma, just to, to offer a comparison, was about 147,000, I think. Yes, yeah. And although melanoma was much less, I think if you exclude non-melanoma, I think at the time of, of pulling this together, it was the second commonest um, cancer I think in adults in the 50 I believe is that sound about right yeah sounds about right so it's 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 um it accounts for probably one percent of all cancers melanoma um it's it's up there in you know common cancers sadly in young people mm. uh, although the vast majority of people who get a melanoma and die from the melanoma tend to be in the elderly uh, but yeah it is increasing and, and that is a reflection on society and our behavior yeah all right good and other than those those three are technically I guess with the two non-melanomas mm. are there any others or is that pretty much it in regard to what we typically see those are the most common ones the other, there are some odd ones you can get sarcoma of the skin you can get a lymphoma of the skin you can get malignancies of hair follicles uh, but the, these tend to be diagnosed having 
have the lesion removed as opposed to what you're looking out for. for but for, um, for us, what we'll need to be looking for our skin realistically is the changing mole, yeah. is the melanoma. That's the one we, we really try and drive the message home in public health campaigns is check your skin, looking for the new mole of a changing mole. Yeah, so, so tell us about how it would typically present then. So what should we be looking for if we're, we're looking and checking our body? Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a good question. I get often that patients say to me, what should I be looking for? Um, you know, what should I be looking out for? So there's good there's good evidence first of all to reassure us all that when patients had have them have got a melanoma they find it they, they find it quite quickly and often find it before the doctor does uh, but the, it would be if you were looking at your own skin it would be either a new mole that you've never had before or an old mole that's changed there's a general rule we use called a b c d e and this is talking about um, a nice way of remembering what to look for. So we're talking about area, border, color, diameter, and E, evolution. E is the key one I like to focus on because anything that turns cancerous has to grow. Be it on your skin, be it in your lung, it's going to grow and it's going to evolve. And as it evolves, it's going to change in appearance or it's going to develop symptoms. So on your skin, you could have had a mole all your life and it might suddenly change in size, it might change in shape, it might change in color but it's evolving, it's definitely changing. Now, moles do change normally, you have to remember that. So as we get older, our moles do change. You tend to lose your moles actually as you get older, but you tend to form other things on your skin, which is what often worries people as they spot a new lesion. So what you're looking for is something that's changing and something that's out of keeping with the rest of your skin. So I always tell my patients, look at your moles, it should look similar to your other moles. If it's the ugly duckling, it's the one that stands out from the crowd, that's the one you need to be more concerned about. Mm. So that's the changing mole. Now, bearing in mind melanoma forms 60, roughly 60, 40 on a new bit of skin where there never was a mole. So really you should be focusing your attention more on the, oh, well, that wasn't there before. And only this week I've seen a lady who said, you know, this wasn't here bef- six, three or four months ago and it's a melanoma. Oh, really? that, that, that fast? Yeah, so it appeared, it wasn't there before and and but 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 she spotted it luckily she spotted it It was on the back of her arm so it's the changing mole or it's the new mole and it tends to stand out from the crowd okay and and just i just want to can we define what a mole is as silly as that might sound because thinking about my own body i've got lots of these i don't know if i can do but kind of what i consider almost freckles really small ones and then Mm -hmm. i've got what sort of maybe one maybe two sort of what i consider a mole which are a little bit bigger yeah so what is the definition of a mole so a mole is if you like the layman's term for what a a dermatologist would call a nevus and a nevus is um a collection of the melanocytes coming back to that same cell line the melanocyte is made up into a nevus so it's called they're called melanocytic nevi and they're different types they're the ones you have from when you're born or the ones you're pre-programmed to have. So those are your congenital moles. And they tend to be smooth, dome-shaped, pink or brown colours. And, um, and, uh, and there's the ones that you then acquire as you get older. They tend to be the flatter patches that can often form around a congenital mole or they form as a new freckle. Now, so those are, that's the, that is what a mole is. So it's a collection of the melanocyte. And that's why if the melanocyte goes bad turns cancerous it would turn into a melanoma and that's why we talk about checking moles mm-hmm. and so you, you talked about the ones to look, to look out for is the the kind of ugly one in the crowd mm. in regard to sort of it being raised or bleeding weeping mm. is that is that a common presentation so that, that's a good point so those are the symptoms of okay. changes of the skin so you know if um if we were to look away from melanoma look at the non-melanoma skin cancers those are the ones that tend to have symptoms melanomas don't often have symptoms uh but you know anything that's scabbing bleeding and not healing that's of concern but that usually is the presentation of someone with a basal cell carcinoma so a good story would be i've got this spot on my head doctor i banged my head on a branch and it's just never healed and every time you know it scabs it bleeds but it never seems to fully heal and what they've done is they've knocked their head on a branch but there was a basal cell carcinoma there that they weren't aware of and they've knocked the top of it off and now it won't heal or they haven't knocked their head on a branch they've just got this spot that won't seem to heal so a sp- things should heal shouldn't they our bodies should repair themselves so if you've got something on your skin that just won't seem to heal that's something to get looked at because that could well be a form of skin cancer but it tends to be one of the low grade indolent types yeah. weeping yes so that would be the scabbing and the bleeding pain things shouldn't be painful on the skin so there are a few things that present with pain one of them is a skin cancer so if you get a painful lump um, you know but it seems to persist and doesn't want to go away with simple analgesia that's another sort of symptom that should pr- pr- make you think about getting a check mm-hmm. 
interested in that. God, yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot. I'm afraid. So, j- just just a little one. Um, my wife's really freckly. Yeah, like really, really freckly. She's got freckles everywhere. Is is should she stay out of the sun more than other people so because it could develop more um, so or not? So like, she's freckly, a bit like me. So she's probably fair skinned. Is she? She's got blonde red hair. No, no, she's not. She's she's got dark hair, but she is really she's freckly. She's freckly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if they're, freckly. If but she get, has got yeah. Like if you're fair skinned, um, then you're more likely to burn, mm-hmm. uh, and you tend to form freckles rather than get a tan. So that's what we call a skin type. Right. And uh, we still use this. It's probably and it's still it's still used looking at skin types one to six. So I'm a one, and that's someone who will never never tan. Uh, will only ever burn, okay? So red head, fair skin, blue eyes. At the other end of the spectrum is black skin, So, and then in between is everything else. It's all about your skin, how you react to the sun. If you're freckly, it sounds like your wife is freckly, she might be of a, of a fairer skin type, mm-hmm. and therefore you should therefore take more care in the sun than if you're of dark skin type who are less likely to get a skin cancer, but bear in mind anyone can get one. You know, So we should all take care in the, in the sun is the, is the yeah. simple answer, um, and because no one's no one's not at risk of skin cancer and bear in mind outside of the skin cancer world when people come to talk to me about how do i how do i make myself look more youthful well it's wear a sunscreen because sunscreen is the number one thing that and smoking that age us so for all the men and women who want to stay youthful for longer you should be staying out of the sun yeah we'll come on to sunscreen in in, in summer care in a bit i want to understand the factors and everything else (laughs) Hi gents, just interrupting the episode to tell you about our sponsor Eden Clinic for Men. You might remember episode 13 when we had Dr. Angela Service on talking about male testosterone deficiency. Um, This is potentially linked to things like low mood, um, low energy, obesity, low libido. So there's a number of different things that this could have an impact on. So if this applies to you, your mates, your dad, your brother, or even if it doesn't and you want to get a baseline number of where your testosterone levels are at, then check out the link below and get yourself a well man check booked in and they do a full blood test, which will also include your hormones, so your testosterone, but also diabetes check as well, so your HbA1c, uh, your lipid profile, which is cholesterol, triglycerides, so the fats in your blood, um, kidney function, liver function, so pretty much everything you need to check to maintain your quality health so check out the link below get yourself checked out and stay in tip-top health um going back to the actual skin cancer then and how it presents um, i'm aware that i think there's different stages of skin cancer as well can you talk us through those so the staging all cancers are staged um uh, because that, and that allows you to give an idea of prognosis or outcome um, and also guide you into managing that patient so with skin cancers we if we look go back to the melanoma patient we do stage those patients so my patient with the one on the arm the first thing is we have to get it removed okay you can't stage it just on its appearance you remove it it goes off to the lab for, for analysis and they will examine it under the microscope and they will do some measurements and they will measure how thick it is and that leads through to the stage okay so they'll see how thick it is they'll see if there's any other features there like ulceration if there's any number of cell counts called a mitosis count and they put all this data together and then they come out with a stage and they might be stage zero or it might be higher now the the earlier stages are based on what they see under the microscope. The next stage is if you then present with it having sadly spread. So if I remove the mole from the lady's arm, but then she gets a swelling in her armpit, it suggests that the melanoma has already bolted and it's made its way up through the through the skin or through the lymphatics into the armpit. And we remove that gland in her armpit and it's got melanoma in, that would upstage her. And then if she then had a scan, a CT scan, we found it had gone to the chest or the liver, that would upstage her as well. So you can go from stage zero to stage four. And, and the way you do that is through assessing the initial mole that you remove and then examining the person. We don't scan everyone. The indication for a scan is not based on you have had a melanoma, everyone gets a scan. Mm. It's based on what they see under the microscope. And if we feel anything, because at the end of the day, most people do just fine who've having had a melanoma. And then if we find that it has spread, then that will dictate what treatment you get. Yeah. And fortunately today, the treatment for stage four melanoma is, is transformed patient's outcome in the last few years. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. In, so, a, in a good way? In a good way. Yeah, in a very okay. good way. Yeah. yeah. And with those various stages then, I mean, we talked about melanoma being the more serious one. Mm. Um, obviously you just mentioned then that it could spread. I mean, it, I, 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 I 
I imagine this is probably going to very much depend on the individual. But like, what are the the time frames typically go from like maybe that stage zero right through stage four? Mm. Like, what would that progression so that time typically take be? Fortunately, in the UK, most people are caught with a very early melanoma, so stage one. Yeah. Stage one melanoma has ninety nine. 98 to 99 percent of those patients will still be alive at five years mm-hmm. so two percent may have f- have died from that disease the 98 percent will be absolutely fine and that is the vast majority of our patients fortunately in the uk uh, that said there is two people who have who died from that disease now they would have been seen by them, their doctor their dermatologist and they would have developed usually a lump at the scar or in the gland and that's what matt triggers the next you know stage of your investigation or treatment uh, so there is no gar- there's no there's no you're not likely to progress through the stages you're likely to stay within your stage uh, from where you, where you start but sadly some people can go from having it just in the skin to having it in the armpit and having it removed and it going no further or having it just in the skin and then presenting 10 years later when they've been long since discharged mm-hmm. with melanoma in their, in their liver. So it is a funny disease. It's a very funny disease. But to reassure your listeners, the vast majority of people do just fine. We catch it early. It's treated surgically. It's removed. They may have a few tests if they if it's deemed necessary. So that's scans. So there's no blood tests available for melanoma. Uh, there's no blood tests that we would do in the investigation or treatment of these patients. Uh, so, uh, and, they, and if we find anything, then we treat it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, Fortunately, if we catch early, the outcome is usually excellent. Good. That's brilliant. That's what we like to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> yeah, it's not all doom and gloom but in my life. But, but <laughs> the good news. Yeah. 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 It's especially as you say, it's, it's relatively common. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah something that people worry about for sure. Mm. Um, so who typically gets it then? Because we, we, we mentioned in the statistics that under 50s, it's, you know, melanomas are um, yeah quite common. But yeah, and we've already kind of mentioned... <laughs> Yeah, I guess that you're seeing more and more, um, mm. and it's it's sort of geographically dependent yeah. slightly as well. So the people who get melanoma, uh, or m- more than most, it, in the younger age groups, it tends to be more women than men, okay. and then men catch up after the age of around 55, 60. Mm. Uh, but the vast majority tend to be in older adults. It is incredibly rare in children incredibly rare yes it, it can happen but it's generally not seen in children which kind of makes sense because if 99.9 percent of melanoma is due to sun damage the more you accrue the more damage you get the more likely you are to get a skin cancer yeah um, the reason women probably get more in a younger age is it's it might be i mean there's lots of factors but one might be more skin exposure uh sunbed use uh sunbathing uh the the, the, the tan wanting the tan uh but but, but that's, that's only a theory. But, you know, there, there, is some, there is some data shows that more women get it than men in the early ages. Mm-hmm. But it's still, um, it's still the, the vast majority of people who get melanoma tend to be in the, in, in the, in the older population. Yeah. Okay. And, and where on the body is, is more common to, to get it? Is it in those areas that see the sun? Yeah, sun, see the sun. So um, there is, you know, backs of legs, backs of arms, upper chest and back. Um, you do get them on the face, but it's not it's not it's not a really common sight. But when I check someone's skin, if I'm doing a thorough job top to toe check, I'll check right through your hair, right through all your skin, down in between your toes, bottom of your feet, check your nails, because they can form anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just one that's come to me that I just wanted to ask on uh, mm. skin tags. Mm. What was because that's like a new growth, isn't it? Is that yeah. to be worried about? What, what uh, is that? Well, be, only only if you only if you think it's it's abnormal and changing because okay. melanomas can present in many different ways. Although we talked about the freckle or the mole that's changing, they can form as a pink lump, mm. and that's a worrying sign. But skin tags are just thickened bits of skin. They tend to form multiple skin tags at the same time. They tend to form at sites of friction. That's why we get them around necks from jewellery and collars, armpits in the groin. If you're if you're carrying a few extra pounds, you generally form skin tags more commonly. Uh, women see them a lot around bra straps. Um, so that's just where there's friction. Uh, but always be mindful. You don't usually have one skin tag. You usually have lots of little skin tags and they tend to be... Not right skin tag. They yeah. tend to be small. No. Not yet. Not, not, not yet. Yeah. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do have one on my back, so I might uh, I might oh, show have to you. Check it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, have a little look out. I won't yeah. whip it out on camera. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's on your as long as long as it's on your back. No, it is on my back. Yeah, yeah don't yeah. worry. It's not anywhere yeah. else. Yeah. No, I'll go to another clinic for that. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so, how do you diagnose this? Then you, you mentioned there's no blood test. Um, you mentioned a little bit about sort of observations. Yeah. Um, and I know you've developed some technology as well around maybe doing this remotely. So, 
So tell us about how you would typically get it diagnosed. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's quite technical, this, isn't it? I'm glad I did my homework before I came. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're looking at your skin uh, or your wife's back and you go, well, there's a, there's a mole, that's a mole, I think it looks different. So the first thing you can do is, well, better get it checked. That's what you're always told, isn't it? You know, see a changing mole, get it checked. Bearing in mind, most of the things we see on our skin, going back to my analogy, the garden are completely harmless. It's just something that pops up on our skin, a benign growth, of which there are lots. Um, so you want to get it checked. So you, you, you see a doctor, you see a GP, and they'll have a look at it. And if they're not sure what it is, they'll refer you on to a specialist, someone like me. Um, and when I take a look at your mole, I take, ask you a few questions to, get, to gather kind of your risk factors for skin cancer. It might be, you know, have you used sunbirds, worked or lived abroad? How long have you had it? It's quite an important question. If you say, well, I had it for years, that's really reassuring. If you're like, well, it wasn't there six months ago. Okay, sounds a little bit more suspicious. And then I need to have a look at it. So we examine your skin with our, you know, the Mark One eyeball. And then we need to get out something called a dermatoscope or sometimes referred to as a dermoscope. So I've brought, I brought mine with, with me to show you. So here's a dermoscope. So this is a medical device, class one medical device. Um, it's basically a, a magnif magnifying glass and it's got little lights in it. And it will allow me to um, take a closer look at your mole in more detail and see surface pattern. And you can place it on the skin or you can hold it on the skin and we look through this side. But obviously the use of this has come on leaps and bounds over the last couple of decades. <clears throat> Before people used to just look at things and, and say, we're not sure, cut it out. But by getting good at this, we've been able to reduce the number of things we need to remove to find out what it is. So if you're an old school doctor and you haven't done this, or you're a non-specialist, the way you find out what things are is you cut them out, you send them to the lab, they look under the microscope and say, that's normal. That's what that's what I had done when I was about 18. I had one on my chin here. Yeah, so... Um, and they just I just went to a GP and he just was like, yep, let's get it off. Yeah, have <laughs> it just off. cut it off there. Like yeah, pretty much there yeah. and then. And like scalp wire, cut it out. And that's what they used to do. And you look at some people's backs and they just replaced all their moles with scars because um, they didn't know what they were looking at. So through through learning demoscopy, that's the science of looking at these things, we're able to look at patterns and work out what is and isn't suspicious and what is or isn't a melanoma or what could be a melanoma, what clearly isn't. So the big spectrum, there's the obviously benign here and there's the obviously dodgy here and there's a bit of a gray area in the middle so my gray area is quite small so a gp's gray area might be really big so they'll go on the side of caution and refer more or, or remove more so that's called a dermatoscope dermoscope so we got to use that to look at your mole and go you're free to go that's absolutely fine or we say i'm not sure or i'm suspicious we'll remove it um, so that's called demoscopy and that's what I need that's what any dermatologist needs to be able to safely assess a, a skin lesion okay and uh, what else have we got on the table there so so I brought you a new toy of mine I've been working on uh, with um, some friends around a year now mm. so as you know it's very tricky to get seen by your GP uh, for anything because they're just so busy mm. so they don't want to see you they're just overwhelmed with work so say you're there you're worried about your mole and you contact the GP surgery, you try and get past the receptionist and you finally get an appointment in say 10 days. Well, you may be not want to wait 10 days or they might say, well, send us a photo, mm. send us a photo. So you email for a photo. It's just a photo on your camera, isn't it? It's not got a, you've, they've not posted you a 2000 pound dermatoscope. They've just said, send me a photo. So they'll look at that photo and most of my friends who are GP say they end up seeing these patients. They go, well, I can't make a call. That's the right thing. They can't really tell you what it is off the macro image. I call it a macro image, a general photo. So they bring you in, they'll have a look. They may or may not have one of these. They probably haven't had the training and they'll probably go, okay, I'm not sure, refer. As a consequence, departments like mine will receive more referrals a week for that patient with a changing mole than we have appointments for. So we have to cancel all our other activity to manage this workload, this bow wave of referrals coming in to our little department. Bearing in mind there's only a handful of us. And therefore anyone else who wants to see me for their eczema, their psoriasis or their hair loss has to wait and wait and wait. And you could wait a year before you're gonna get seen for your rash that's keeping you up at night and keeping your wife up at night and stopping your kid sleeping because I've got so many patients coming in on this other pathway called the two-week weight cancer fast track pathway. Got to see those patients can't miss the skin cancer. How many of those do you think actually have a skin cancer? I would hate to even guess. How, how many? 5%? Yeah. Is it 5? 5%. Round here, our GPs are good. It's probably slightly higher. It's probably more like 8 or 9%. Their hit rate's higher. In other parts of the countries, it's lower. Mm. No way. So I'll see 100 patients and 5 might have a skin cancer. 
as in a melanoma or, or one of those non-melanoma squamous cell carcinoma types. So lots and lots of reassurance going on. Not much, not much need. Plus, you've taken a day off work. You've paid to park. You may have driven 45 minutes each way for me to come in, get my thing and go, you're absolutely fine. I might check the rest of your skin while you're there as well, make sure there's nothing else. So anyway, back to what we've got on the table. So, okay, so this is a dermoscope. It's a, like this. It looks very different because that's for me to use in clinic. If I just want you to send me a photo, this has been developed so you can attach it to your phone. So you've taken your photo mm -hmm. and then you put one of these on, depending on what camera you, you phone you've got. As long as you've got a camera in the top corner, yeah. you put it over the camera lens, sort of slots on, it's pretty much fits any camera. And you set your phone up, put a bit of oil on your skin, and you push it against and let your camera do the work and it will focus and take that image I referred to with the detail of the surface of the mole. You send me that, and now, we got, now we're talking. Now I can tell you, you need to get in here sharpish, or now I can say, do you know what? You don't need to come in. That's not even a mole. Because of oh, that 95% yeah. that are benign, most of them aren't moles. We talked about the nevus and melanocytes. There's something else altogether. Something called a hemangioma, benign blood vessel collection. You weren't to know that. You just spotted it and went, what the hell is that? Is it a wart? Is it a seborrheic, what's called a seborrheic keratosis? These hard, rough things that people get on their backs. Is it a skin tag? But you don't know because you're worried. You just know there's something on your skin. It's new, it's changing, it's bled, it's itched. I've got to get it checked. So by deploying these, we can send these to patients. <clears throat> you can complete a questionnaire on the app that comes with it. And you can come through. And if someone like me can review that image remotely, in seconds really mm. you know within a minute i can make a decision whether or not you need to come in and will be seen and the the plan is that this could be sat with the gp receptionist mm. so when you ring in saying you're worried about your mole they can say well do you have a smartphone or do you have or do you does do you have access to one how do you fancy sending some photos through and that's where that could sit but at the moment, it's not currently commissioned within the NHS. That's something we're working towards. But it is available for you to pay to have that um, that that report. How, how much is one of these? Well, the, the the lens is given to you for free when you subscribe through the app, and the and the currently it's around fifty pounds to get a consultant's opinion. Well, wow, that's really good. It's really, 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 really good. Yeah, it's, yeah. Such, it's such a simple little thing. Isn't so, it? Where, how how can I invest? Yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know they've done all the hard yeah, work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you can um, you, you, you can use it and you can share your thoughts and see what you think. But yeah, I've got a, I've got one on my face, mate. That, um, well, I will check before I go home. But, but <laughs> we, when we started this, this was never this was never started out as a business venture. This was yeah. started out to try and solve the problem of capacity, yeah. demand, and supply. It's a, it's a fantastic um, idea, though. Yeah, and um, yes, it's not this. And yes, there'll be the naysayers who say, you, you know, it's not as good as that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, 95% of those lesions are benign. And most of them, yeah. you can, so my, I or my colleagues could recognize off a humble photo taken with this and this. And you don't need to have all that other stuff around it. And by freeing up those appointments, mm -hmm you come on in with your bad psoriasis and bad eczema because I don't need 300 appointments now. I only need 150. Do you think the NHS will commission that at some point? We, yeah, I've got some, um, there's, we're going to be doing some more studies. <laughs> we've going to, we've, we've done a pilot. We've trialed it. We've shown it's fit yeah. for purpose. Yeah. We're hoping to get some engagement with um, uh, local GP practice who are going to uh, run a test with us, see how much time we can save them. Cause then yeah. the that's what everyone's short of is time. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can look at that image in a matter of a minute, cause at the end of the day, you've done all the hard work at home. You've done all the photos. You filled out the questions all within the app. I just need to look at it and tell you yes or no. You know, yeah, that's brilliant. Right? Reassure, not sure. Come on in. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, mate. Well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, amazing. I wanted to ask why GPs wouldn't just have a dermoscope. So GPs do have dermoscopes. But bear in mind, a GP is supposed to be good at everything. Yeah. Well, they can't be good at everything. Let's be honest. You know, they've, they've got too much on their plate. How much time does a GP get in learning dermatology? Mm. Do you know any idea how much time they spend in? Well, I think appointments, with, uh, 10 minutes max, is it? But during their training. How, oh, in the training, we, yeah. We've spoke about this, haven't they, yeah. with Angela and stuff. They do such small amounts yeah. of everything. Yeah. They? they do such small amounts. So yeah, go on, how much some of our GPs locally get to train with us for three months. Most GPs get maybe a couple of weeks in their entire GP program. And suddenly they sit there in the GP surgery and someone goes, can you have a look at that? And they're like, <laughs> uh, 
well, let's have, let's have, and they, they won't have one of these. And if they do, it'll be in a bottom drawer or it'll be in yeah. a different room. So have a look at it, but they're not sure. Better send off that yeah. referral. Um, <clears throat> so the poor GPs are doing their best. Bearing in mind, a lot of GPs aren't GPs now. There are um, healthcare professionals such as paramedics, mm-hmm. nurse practitioners. I mean, how much time have they done in dermatology? Even less. And their threshold to refer is even lower. Um, so it's a perfect storm, sadly. Um, so anything I can do, we can do to help my GP colleagues is got to be a good thing, yeah. um, because that's that's where the problem I think is is trying to help my help my GP team out. And, and if they can't, if they're not confident, or they're not good at this, then we should cut, step in and, and take off some of the work for them. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, mate. That's great. Um, okay, um, so we've we know what skin cancer is. Mm. We know who gets it. Uh, we know how it presents. We know how to get it diagnosed now, both at home and... Uh, well, everyone now is now like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said something about it changing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I came across you um, primarily from your social media. Mm. And pretty much every post... Um, it comes up with sensitive content before I view it. Yeah. And that's because there's some very graphic pictures of some of the work that you do mm. to treat um, skin cancer. So pardon the pun, but let's dig into that a little bit and, yeah. and kind of understand some of the work you do. Because I've got to say, from what I've seen, you you do a, you create a very candid picture of what it is you do. Mm. And you see the before, you see the hole in someone's face or body, and then you see the the kind of the, the, the work you do afterwards and then the after. And, and honestly, the, the work is this man does is incredible mm. because I've you just can't see even the scarring mm. and you'll genuinely mate you'll see a hole that big in someone's face and then you'll see the after pictures and you can't even see the do you, know, do you know that sensitive content stuff if I see that yeah. I just don't fucking click it I'll be honest so uh, uh, Kirsty loves like uh, Dr. Pimple Popper yeah. you know where they like pop like squeeze all the spots yeah. and you know what I'm on about yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, she yeah. loves it and yeah. I'm like I can't watch that just yeah. turn it off have you not watched Channel 5, Skin A&E? No, mate, I, don't, I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> you like might, stuff might, like that. You I'm might like, recognise one of the dermatologists on that if you watch that now. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's yeah, cool. I'm, there's five of us. I'm one of the, one of the, oh, one wow. of the five, yeah. And what, what, what show was that you say? So Skin A&E on Channel 5. Okay. I've done it a few seasons now. There's, um, it's full filmed in Birmingham and they bring in real patients. It's basically okay. Dr. Pimple Popper. And yeah, we just <laughs> cut, cut, cut holes with people oh, on wow. TV. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going back to the the stuff you're seeing on my social media is patients who've had skin cancer mm-hmm. excised from their face using this technique called Mohs micrographic surgery or Mohs surgery. So to, to us to explain that, so Mohs was a man. People say, what does it stand for? M-O-H-S, surgery. It doesn't, it's his name, Mohs surgery. And they're like, oh, how long has that been around? I'm like, well, probably nearly 100 years. It's not new. It's evolved a fair bit, but it's definitely not new. It's just there's not many of us who do it. And for some strange reason, people just don't seem to talk about it. Uh, it might be because other people feel it's not necessary and they can, they can do the same job without this specialist technique. Um, so what is it is where you've got a skin cancer on your face and you're going to have to have an operation. Now, if you're going to go through that, you want to make sure that the skin cancer, when I say skin cancer, I'm really talking about the non-melanoma skin cancers. You can do it for m- m- melanoma, but that's... It's not something I offer because it's technically different kettle of fish. You have to have different lab facility to do it. So going back to the cancer on your face, your basal cell or your squamous cell, someone's told you you need an operation. You're like, oh, can I cut this out? They cut it out and they come back to you two months later and say, we didn't go wide enough. We didn't go deep enough. And that's because what you see is the tip of the iceberg, if you like. And these things can track out, they can invade into little skin nerves and they can, they can go a lot further under the surface, what we call subclinical extension, than the naked eye can see. So Mohs came up with this technique where you cut the cancer out, you process it, and then you examine that piece of skin while you sit and wait and see if you've got it all. So if you like, it's an intraoperative test. You, you remove it, you test it, you, come back to the patient, take a bit more, test it, take a bit more, test it until it's all gone. So you're creating a map. So I have a bit of paper, I literally have a picture of your face, where I've cut the hole, and I know exactly where I'm going. So if I get, I take it into the lab, we process it. So we look at the entire margin, took 100% margin control, as opposed to conventional sections are only a few percentage. At every point, I'm looking in the microscope where you're sitting having a cup of tea, and I can say, right, it's still there. It's at the six o'clock position. I'll bring you back in, take a piece more. And we cut a hole, therefore, to the size of the cancer, no bigger, no smaller. So your chance of it coming back is zero to none. As opposed to non mo surgery, you might be looking anywhere up to 5 to 10 to 15%. And in some centers, it's incomplete, as in 
people not removing it is like one in five. So what I do is I make sure you get the highest cure rate and then I need to put you back together. But because I've got rid of all the cancer, I can then take my time to reconstruct your part of your face in a way that's going to give you the best aesthetic outcome okay. without risking pulling the nose, pulling the lip, depressing mm. it, pulling on the eyelid. Um, so that's called Mohs Micrographic Surgeon. There's only a handful of us in the UK who do it. Okay. Um, so is someone awake when this is happening? Yes, you are awake. Yeah. Okay. Awake. And in, it's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you said you cut a hole, go yep. away, come back a bit more. Yeah until you got the job done yeah or someone sat there awake yeah well, well you're, you're actually you're having you're you have a dressing on and you sit and and you sit it's, you'll be surprised how well tolerated it is okay so during the day you're awake all done with injections you yeah. know and we deliver them in a way that you don't really feel them so patients always give us plaudits that i didn't feel that injection doctors so we've got nice techniques to numb the side of your nose or your cheek if you're feeling a bit anxious, we give you a happy pill. Just take the edge off things, like having a whiskey by the fire. Just to, just take the, it's a bit of an anxiolytic, but nearly everyone gets through it absolutely fine. As um, long as there's no pain and the, there's no bleeding. And there's no mirror. And they're not looking in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, <face laughs> open. The, the, the other option is going to sleep and having an operation of sleep. You can't do this surgery with your sleep because it's quite time consuming. It might take two or three hours. Yeah. I can't have you asleep during that time. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, Got yeah. That. but yeah, yeah. So that repair job you do, then would you typically like? How how do you not pull on all these other bits? Do, is it skin graft from somewhere else? Um, do? So uh, a skin graft is where you cut a bit of skin from somewhere else yeah. and you stir it on like a patch. So there are parts of the face I do a skin graft, like on the wing of the nose. They tend to catch the eye. They tend to look a bit unsightly, so I tend to avoid them. Instead, I do something called a flap. And the flap is a funny word. It's basically where you incise and elevate a neighboring bit of skin and move it across in a way that doesn't create too much tension anywhere. So we've all got spare bits of skin, what we call a reservoir. And it's just about learning where the reservoir of skin is, where to make the incisions to hide them in your natural shadow lines at the boundaries, or what we call cosmetic units. So down the side of the cheek, in the corners of the eyes, Interestingly, running straight up through the forehead, not across in the wrinkles, they tend to catch the eye more. And if you can learn how to execute these incisions, how to move the skin in a way and stitch it meticulously, the scars should be imperceivable at around six months. Um, yes, there will be a scar, but hopefully, you know, my, my greatest pleasure is doing an operation and patients can't even see you've had an operation, which is a bit of a joke really, because I spend so long and hard learning and they don't even, there's nothing to see at the end of it but that gives me a great joy when they come back because you think it's terrifying you're lying there having this guy this bold ginger guy cutting into you and you're like I hope this is going to go well and then they take the big reveal off seven days later and they're like Whoa. Oh, that's good. And then it gives you a big reward. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, if, if anybody can stomach a bit of gore, you should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, yeah. Yeah. So I said I'm not. I, I wouldn't normally. Honestly, but I, I've mate, got to go watch it. Yeah, I'll watch it. Have yeah, I will have a look. If if I hadn't seen it, I'd be sat here a bit cynical. I think, but I, yeah. I've, I've seen his work and it's yeah. it's incredible. Oh, thank you. Yeah well, yeah. well, thank you to my patients for letting me put them put their photos up there. It's all there as a learning exercise. That's why it's there, yeah. is to show people who may be coming for an operation. This is what it looks like. There's the there's the gory bit, but yeah. there they are at six weeks, yeah. and they're like, oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. So with like later stage cancer, then if it were to have spread into like the lymph nodes or something, mm -hmm. and you need to whip them out what's that? What, what's that procedure look like? Is is that a little bit more complex? Yeah, right? that's a bit more complicated. So. You know, I'm a dermatologist. We don't we don't work in silos. We work in teams. So within the melanoma or the skin cancer team, we'll have oncologists. They're the doctors who have access to these wonder drugs. There's other surgeons. That might be a breast surgeon, might be a plastic surgeon, <clears throat> might be a head and neck surgeon. So those the surgeons would be the ones that would go in and test the lymph node. So remove it um, or remove it. Um, and that yes, you'll be asleep for an operation like that. But if you were to find that swelling and having known that was the arm you had your skin cancer in, then we would then need to, you know, like you say, go in and find that swelling and find out what it is um, and get it tested. Yeah. Okay. And what, what are the potential side effects or complications of, of doing these procedures? So those sort of procedures, they come with some risks. Mm. Bearing in mind, I don't do them, mm. but the patients who have had them done, most are absolutely fine. Usual problems here, infection, pain, swelling. If you have all your lymph nodes removed, which is commonly done more in women who say have had breast surgery, then you're at risk of, say, swelling of your arm called lymphedema. Yeah. 
but no, most of the skin cancer patients who've had an operation um, don't have any long-lasting side effects from, the, from their surgeries. Yeah, so you don't need all of your nodes then to support your, your lymphatic system because it doesn't work like that? No, okay. no. They, so when we t- check a node, it's a difficult one to explain, but that's a test, not a treatment. So if you've got melanoma that's gone to your lymph node, we'll remove that node. That's not treating you. We're just taking out to see if there is or isn't melanoma in there. And part of that staging calculation, once they've looked under the microscope and they've seen certain features, they might be we then go and take a node as part of your test to establish what stage you're at. And that, that node, if it's got some in it, that doesn't make necessarily mean you're going to be better off that we've removed it or remove all your other nodes for that matter. It doesn't necessarily mean it'd be better off. We we tend to recommend doing it, but there is a you know, there's evidence suggests that does it make a difference to your long term outcome? May, maybe not. Yeah. I had a friend who had uh, had that played football with him. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he got a change in his moles and then um cut a load of moles out of his back and then it went to his lymph nodes and, but he, he's fine he did he was, he was fine. fine yeah absolutely fine yeah, yeah. He, um, he's quite a young lad was he your age yeah Zach so he was uh, two years older than me so he's probably 35 36 really? now yeah. so at the time though he's probably 30 maybe a bit younger yeah, yeah. Um, horrible time for him obviously <clears throat> and um, you know when it when it spread a little bit it was like oh god it's scary but yeah he, um, yeah he's fine in, in, in well fine been fine since yeah so. yeah i mean it touched wood you know he'd be just fine but yeah he's um it's a terrifying time for these patients and we you know part of my job is trying to see it's lovely to see them and reassure them that's absolutely nothing wrong with that and that's how technology like this can really help just get you immediate reassurance <clears throat> but there are those ones like my lady with the arm where you have to basically tell them i'm, af- I'm not sure this is going to be good news mm. but we've got to get on with it i didn't give you the skin cancer i'm here to help you yeah, yeah. sometimes patients forget that we're trying to help them you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm gonna, we're going to treat this we're going to remove it and we'll do it quickly as we can yeah no it's good um and in regard to, and this is probably more of a general cancer question, I guess, but like red flags. So other than seeing a uh, sort of mole, are there any other symptoms that people should be aware of? Um, not not for your, not for the melanomas or the non-melanomas we talked about. It is really about checking your skin. That's what we talk about, getting a skin check. People never feel ill or anything like that? Not, not from a skin cancer, no. I mean, if you've got a melanoma and like your, your friend and then it spread and then he said, well, I've or he felt a swelling in his arm, that would be a sign. But no, things like lethargy, and weight loss and breathlessness these these are usually sign these are non-specific symptoms we would say but you might see those in association with other cancers but no with skin it's very much what we see on the surface yeah that's what counts all right perfect all right so that's more technical stuff out of the way i guess mm. um <laughs> i can rest i can rest these you know yeah just take a breath <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk about summer yeah let's talk about summer shall we so Obviously, what's that, this. What's that again? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, well, yeah, what? Is that, the week, is that the week between spring and autumn? Yeah, it's the thing that you need to get on a plane to yeah, go and enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of bits to this, I guess. So obviously, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of press at the moment around uh, obviously global warming mm. um, and the impact that's going to have on, on various things, but our skin obviously being one. Um, obviously, every summer, um, you know, Brits are notorious for just migrating abroad. Yeah. Uh, diving out in the sunshine, getting mm. bright reds. Um, I mean, what's yeah? I, I guess the the question is. Let's start with the global warming one. Like, it, do you see that as a major major concern? I know this is a little bit political, so don't get into that if you don't want to. But I guess good, I've never been asked that question. Not not really in terms of incidence or increased risk yeah. of skin cancer. Right, well, it's it's UV, it's ultraviolet radiation that gives us the skin cancer or predisposed to it so I guess global warming is more to do with the world's just heating up um, and a change in climates so no it, it, I don't think it's going to have much of an impact on skin cancer incidents other than that if we get more sunny days warmer mm. days then people are more inclined to take their clothes off yeah. so that might be the secondary phenomenon of global warming uh, but it's not 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 direct impact on your skin yeah all right good good news that's um yes that's finally. one less to worry about yeah finally. <laughs> sick <laughs> um okay um so so danny touched on obviously as ever have been quite freckly and, mm. and we kind of touched on um on, on sun cream and, and, and stuff but yeah you know can you how do you stay safe in the summer What's the key advice? Yeah, so um, you've probably heard things like from Australia that slip, slap, slop. Um, no, 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 you heard that. So um, I'll, get, I'll get it right now. So it's slip on a hat, slap on some sunscreen and and sit in the shade or something. Anyway, <laughs> we can look it up. That sounds so Australian. Slip, I was about to say. Slip, 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 sl
sunscreen and seeking shade really um, so that's how you, that is that's the bare bones of it now how do we actually do that in practice well we all know what sunscreen is we all use sunscreens we probably don't use enough so we can we'll drill down into that in a second different times of day different times of year the risk is higher than lower so that's where you can look at the uv index for that day and we'll touch on that and then there's the clothing you know what should you wear what shouldn't you wear so should we have so should we go on sunscreens should we have a chat let's around let's do that yeah yeah so sunscreens are i mean there's loads out there isn't there and they're varying different prices and a good one i get usually from female patients is oh but i've got an spf you know that's the word it's a sun protection factor in my daily moisturizer because that's what it says on the thing spf it's like yeah but it's not a sunscreen is it you haven't bought it as a sunscreen you've bought it as your is your very expensive daily skincare regime. And the S that's in there, the SPF, but it's probably in there as a preservative. It was in there anyway. It's just a nice way of selling it to you. So you've got to buy a sunscreen. Don't get fooled into, well, I'm going to use my daily moisturizer because it's got SPF in it. Sunscreen's got numbers on them. And if they're made by high street shops like Boots, they might have star ratings on them as well. So the numbers and the stars relate to UVB, and UVA, UVB, ultraviolet B, ultraviolet A, wavelengths of light. And those are the ones that damage our skin and cause aging and skin cancer. So the SBF number, which we'll talk about 50s and 30s, that's protecting UVB. And the other one is the stars of UVA. If they're not a, a boot, they might say very high UVA. So when you're looking to buy one, you want a high, num high number and you want it to say very high or have five stars. And the reason there's no point looking at anything other than the SBF 50s, in my opinion, and a high star rating is you're not getting SPF 50. Do you know what SPF 50 means? Like if we're at 50. So 50 supposedly means you can sit in the sun for 50 times longer than you than without sunscreen on before you before you burn. So say you burn in 10 minutes. I mean, you're not going to sit in the sun for 500 minutes before you burn. <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't work. So these are lab-based numbers. This is the, the lumber they might get before you get this minimal erythema dose there's all this scientific jargon that they've done to generate a number but the bottom line is 50 will block out 98 percent of uvb whereas a 30 might block out something like 96 97 percent sounds like a marginal difference but in reality it's a big difference because it's the way these curves the way these drugs are made they're not they're not dose responsive so if you put on a 50 and you don't put on enough you're going to get a 30. But if you don't put on enough 30, the curve drops off and you might be getting like a 10 or a 15. So you always want to get a much higher number as far up the line as possible, knowing that you're not getting 50, but you're getting them blocking out as much UVB as possible. You still tan, okay? You're still going to get your tan. You're still going to get that, you know, that summer holiday feeling, but you're not going to get the UV damage to your skin. So that's the UVB. So I would say use a 50 because you're not going to get a 50. Do you know what sunscreen you have to put on your face to get a 50 on your face? I'd love to know. It's a load. It's <laughs> like, well, it's uh, it's around a quarter of a teaspoon, right? Which doesn't sound like a much, but get a teaspoon out and pump pump your spray in. It's a lot. You Most of us put on like two or three bits and rub it in yeah. and we probably miss large areas of our face. So put on a high factor, put on with a high star rating, reapply regularly. So it says on the bottle, not that anyone ever reads this, the sort of thing I do read though, because I'm a bit of a loser. <laughs> you know, it says put on half an hour before you go out and reapply every two hours and before you, and after toweling and after being in water, because you're washing it off. So the sunscreens out there, the people say, oh, I've got a once daily sunscreen. I wouldn't trust that. Uh, oh, I don't need a 50. My doctor said I should only wear a 20 or I shouldn't put that on my kid. <clears throat> the numbers are not real. Just go with a higher number. doesn't matter what brand. They're all very good. At the end of the day, they can't sell it, especially to children, unless it's going to do its job. It's just what it feels like, whether it rub, rubs in, whether it leaves a sheen. Um, so I tend to go with a you know a big high street make or a big cosmetic make, you know, ones you know. The way people come with difficulties when they're allergic to it and they say, oh, they're reacting to the sunscreen, it might be there's a preservative in there or a fragrance that sets their skin off. So that's when people tend to then go shopping around for slightly different ones. But on the whole, majority of us, be absolutely fine so there's your sunscreen Has, does that make sense yeah perfect that's why i didn't know that but yeah 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 it does so, um and the interesting bit there because i know this is I, I thought this in the past as well is is you can still get a good quality tan yeah 
with Factor 50. You're still going to get a tan. I was, yeah. I was about to say, when he was talking, he said it. But yeah, I was yeah. about to say, well, can I still get a tan? Yeah, you <laughs> like, still get a bit of a tan. And you still make your vitamin D. It's another question, all brought out my vitamin D levels yeah. now. Still gonna get, you're still going to be producing vitamin D with sunscreen on because you're not getting a complete block. Mm. You know, you're not in completely covered from the sun and none of us apply it regularly enough anyway. Mm. Most of us when we go on holiday might put it on first thing and they may not reapply until five, six hours later. Well, that mm. first application has long since worn off or gone or rubbed off or, or washed off. Mm. Um, unless you see me on holiday, I'm the guy with the hat, the shirt, <laughs> just socks Just, just a little out. one on that. Yeah. Um, if you get in the pool and get back out, yeah, does that just wash it off and you've got? Well, to some of it will have come off, yeah. So yeah. you should then reapply. But you know, when okay. do you stop? You'd be like reapplying, reapplying the whole time. Yeah, but, no. yeah, yeah. So always take lots of sunscreen on holiday because you don't want to run out. Yeah. Uh, but with with my wife and I, we got three little kids, we'll be spraying these kids, reapplying. So then it becomes a bit of a faff, doesn't it? Putting on sunscreen. So then we go. Well, let's look at clothing. So UV rash vests, wide brim hats. So I always wear a wide brim hat. If you look at your face, if you put a peak cap on in a sunny day, look at yourself in the mirror and see how much of your face is shaded by that peak. Mm. None of it. Like, basically, everything's in the sun. So it looks cool, keeps the sun off this bit, but it's not doing much for the tops of your ears, back of your neck. So that's why, you know, look at old fashion photos. People used to wear wide brim hats before they had sunscreen. Everyone was saying, especially women, great big hats. So nice brim. Doesn't look cool, but does the job. I was just thinking, you must look <laughs> fucking great on holiday. Yeah, 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 yeah. There he is again with his tilly hat on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, head yeah. To tell. yeah, but you go to Australia and New Zealand, you know, it's quite cool. Everyone's cruising around in large wicker hats. For, um, yeah, so you don't have to wear them. This is just, this is the advice. You know, no, yeah, it's it's yeah. UV protective. So with kids, it'd be like rash vests generally, because you can't be putting sunscreen on the whole. Try and keep hats on them. And then that's, your, you know, your clothing, your sunscreen. And then it's like, well, then look at the, your weather apps. So I don't know if you ever, you know, when you get your phone out, you go, what's, the, what's it going to do today temperature wind it will say uv high if you scroll down it will show the uv i uv index mm -hmm. it'll give you a number that's up to 10 and in the summer in the uk it might get sevens maybe even eights you should be putting a sunscreen on really when it's above two believe it or not so it's moderate strength wow. not 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 because that's because if you want to reduce your uv damage so we can you know you could take if you're taking this all the way to the to the wire i want to absolutely max out in my reduce the skin cancer it would be check your weather app See what the UV's doing. Large part of the time in the UK is in ones and twos. So you don't need to be worrying about it. But on a summer's day, even when it's cloudy, it might be five or six. So you think, oh, it's not, it's not sunny, but the UV, the ultraviolet is there. So you put a sunscreen on. If you're in a holiday, we went to um, Turkey recently and it was, um, you know, 34 degrees, <coughs> UV index nine from around, you know, eight, from around, I don't know, m late morning to four in the afternoon. So like, well, okay, we'll do the, Act some activities indoors then or we'll eat we'll eat and we'll just sit in the shade but it's all about managing your risk isn't it it's like everything we do in life comes with a risk you still want to be enjoying the outdoors i love i'm a big outdoors person so i spend a lot of time outdoors but i just wear sunscreen wear a hat try and sit in the sun or seek shade in the middle of the day um, yeah. and that is it that's what you got that's all we got in terms yeah. of protecting yourself all right good advice um when people get sunburned and they're like bright red mm. But how much damage is that doing? Well, quite a bit, probably. Um, it's, um, it's another one, like, patients will say, oh, I know I've, oh, this is probably all sun damage from when I was a kid or, or we didn't have sunscreens when I grew up. Well, it's kind of true. So anyone who's probably born in, who's, who's in their late 60s now probably didn't have sunscreen as a kid. They were probably encouraged to sit outside and get a burn. Mm. Um, and that's why we see, probably seeing more skin cancer now because that, that cohort of patients are coming through. <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, you know, single burns are, are thought to increase your risk of a skin cancer later in life. So a bad burn is is never a good thing. But we've all had them. We don't all get a skin cancer. Let's be yeah. honest. And then when you peel as well, is that is that just that's that top layer just coming off like yeah. a snake? Yeah, you've done enough. It's like a you know, is a burn. It's like yeah. me, scolding me, yourself. Me being an idiot, like six weeks no, two months ago when we had that nice weather, mm -hmm. went to the beach and I was like, oh, I'll be all right. I'll put the sun sun cream on in a minute. Cassie was like, put it on, put it on. I was like, nah, in a minute, in a minute. I fell asleep, mm. woke up, burnt. And yeah. then I shed like a snake. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, so she didn't draw a smiley face on your back then when you were asleep? No, she would have drawn a cock, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> small, small, small. <laughs> yeah well, of course, oh, yeah. mate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, um, I always love it when you're on holiday and you see the, the, the gang who have, um, they've gone, oh, I'm going to burn and it's going to, you know, of in tan, oh, sorry, I'll tan, I'll tan. You're like, well, you, you just look like a lobster, don't you? You see the yeah. British tourist makers coming back, or the guy whose wife has put the sunscreen on the back, 
but only done like the top half and there's like this waving <laughs> sign yeah. of sunscreen and it stops and it's bright red on their lower back yeah. or their belly is oh, I don't need it in here so yeah it's, it's difficult isn't it but you know you've got to go on holiday you've got to enjoy yourself but generally would you know put some summer cream on and then maybe put your shirt on after a few hours go I just don't need my shirt on the whole time I don't need my don't need my chest out the whole holiday yeah, mm. yeah. all right perfect um, sunbeds yeah what's the truth are they bad for you are they good for you they're bad, yeah. Okay. I'm afraid. How yeah. bad? They're bad news. You love having me on this show, don't you? Oh, me. I yeah. <laughs> well, some, I need so, to know. So, yeah, admittedly, I am I am a, a long-term sunbed user. Okay. Although, not not sort of drastically, but yeah, yeah, I do. And and I, I've noticed I go to console, um, and more recently, it just seems to be getting busier and busier, and it just seems to be like a booming market. Yeah. It, well, it's worrying if it is. I know in some countries they're banned, they're illegal. Okay. And like in Australia, you know, they're not allowed. So the, 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 the bottom line is it's been shown that people who've used some beds, especially before the age of 35, have a much higher likelihood of getting a melanoma than those who've never used them. And as a consequence, people like the WHO, the World Health Organization, do not recommend some beds because they are clearly an independent risk factor for you getting a melanoma than not um, and when you're dealing with something that could kill you uh, over getting a tan because it's just a cosmetic thing tan, you know it's 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 just not worth the risk um, why it's probably a question for someone else but the the, the machines are emitting ultraviolet as a word again radiation and they should be highly regulated but you know we don't know what's coming out of those tubes but, you know there could be ultraviolet radiation that never even hits the Earth's surface because the ozone would block it out. Yeah, you're lying right underneath it. Mm. You know. So going back to my lady with the one on the arm, guess what she used to love doing? Yeah, she loved the sunbeds. And we all we all know the sunbed when they change the tubes. Yeah. <laughs> you get on you think, God, this is hot today. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, after I said, why are you doing it? If you're doing it because you want to tan, it's probably not worth it. Uh, or if you're willing to take the risk and you know that you might be paying for this down the line, then by all means take that risk. But yeah, they are they they probably shouldn't exist. In my right. Opinion. Okay. You know. So there's not even like a, a dosage thing. It's just straight bad for you. It's just bad. It was like smoking, isn't it? It's not like one cigarette's okay. You know, there's a th there's a point to which smoking becomes bad. It is just not good for you. Yeah. It's the same with some beds, I'm afraid. Sorry to sorry to sorry, talk. Right. Yeah, that is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm worried more about you can see him like oh, I'm worried more yeah. about this single tag that I got yeah, exactly. like, no, after, yeah. after that because yeah. yeah, I've been using them for uh, for many years before yeah. I was 35. Yeah. But people used to always do them um, and and still do them because they don't know the risk. Uh, they make you feel good. Don't get me wrong. You know, sunshine helps. Uh, I think that's uh, a big thing in the yeah. UK though. Is that you, we ne we rarely get the sun. Mm. It's quite nice just lay there and feel like you're on a beach. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like just the feeling yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even about the time for me sometimes. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you know what, I just need a bit of sun. I've been working in a in a gym all day. Yeah. And I feel like I, get, I don't get anything. So then I'm like... I totally understand that. And you know, a bit of sun on our skin makes you feel good. Yeah. And it's been shown, and it's been shown people who've had a melanoma who are then really good at sun protecting themselves. Or, you know, don't want to get another one. Within a few years, they're back to their old habits. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they soon, people soon forget. But because they liked it. They like it. It's part of their lifestyle. Yeah. You know, it's easy for someone like me who's, who I don't get on with the sun because they just give me a sunburn. So I'm always going to put a sunscreen on. But it doesn't stop me going outside, cycling, running, swimming. I still do all of that, you know. But I wouldn't use a sunbed because I know that that's just not going to be doing my skin any favours. I can imagine you see so much of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I guess when you spend all day long, you know, cutting holes in people's faces and putting them back together again and, and telling people that is not good, you know, it makes you realise, you know, my kids, they, they love being dermatologist kids you know they're like i just want a tan dad it's cool no, having a tan i'm like the tan. smoking used to be cool but it's not cool anymore yeah. and you're not going to start smoking that is very <laughs> yeah. true yeah. okay yeah i think a lot of people's arguments with like the australia ban would be that they get sunshine so yes. a combination of both is, is yeah probably a bad i get thing. i get that i get that you know but if you're going to do it you know ideally not very often and ideally not at all yeah. but no one no dermatologist will ever condone using a sunbed yeah okay um, and then the other thing as well is obviously vitamin D and, and I've seen a couple of um, sort of articles where they're suggesting there's just a chronic deficiency in the yeah, UK. Yeah. Um, and the stuff that we've just talked about, so obviously the, the not using sunbeds, the use, use of sunscreen, that doesn't impact your ability to absorb and, and get vitamin D then? No, so yeah, it's a, good, it's a good one. So 
the vitamin D is, is majority of it we do produce from sunshine. Mm. And unsurprisingly, in this country, when we don't get much sunshine for large chunks of the year, we become vitamin D deficient. And a large part of our population, including all of us, are probably vitamin D deficient in the winter. And I believe it's now a recommendation for the NICE guidelines um, is that adults, especially those who don't spend much time outdoors, should take vitamin D supplementation. And you can buy that. It's not going to be prescribed. You just buy that. It's in a multivitamin. It's in very, very affordable. It's the sort of question you could put to your local pharmacist or uh, health food shop. You know, I want to get more vitamin D in my diet. It is in foods, but most of it does come from sunshine. So if we're not in the sun, our vitamin D level is going to drop. Does that matter? Well, vitamin D plays a part in lots of our body's mechanisms of action and how things work. Don't fully understand its importance, but it makes sense to have it up. And therefore, why not take a vitamin D supplement during the winter months? And if you're someone who's got dark, darker skin types, you're going to get less vitamin D produced because your skin is darker, so less vitamin D is getting through. And or you wear lots of clothing, be that for personal reasons, religious reasons, or because you work indoors, then again, you might want to take vitamin D throughout the year um, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so yeah, I would take vitamin D. Yeah. I take vitamin D. Um, but when you're in the summer months, you don't need to worry about being vitamin D deficient if you're wearing sunscreen. It's estimated, I think the last time I heard someone talk about this was the amount of sunshine you need to get vitamin D is something like 20 minutes, two or three times a week on like your forearms. Right. So oh, okay. not so a huge amount, yeah. not a huge yeah. amount. So never argument shot down right there. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much, not much. Yeah, not much. So yeah, a bit of, bit of sunshine and then some tablets during the, um, yeah. during the winter. Yeah, you just mentioned about different skin types then, which, which brought me back to the sunscreen the thing actually just to, to circle back real quick um darker skinned people are they do they need less sunscreen or would you just recommend 50 regardless of your skin tone? no so if you've got darker skin you are producing that melanocyte cell if you like that's producing the pigment called melanin and that if you like is that is the umbrellas that are held by the rest of the skin cells above them to stop the damage coming through so I don't have much melanin, so it's just white. If you've got black skin, you've got loads of melanin. So there's a whole layer of melanin, which is, which is a protein protecting uh, the ultraviolet getting through to the clockwork underneath. So that's where the damage happens. That's where the skin cancer comes. It's protecting those cells. So they wouldn't need as much sunscreen. But And therefore, most people of dark skin who live in different parts of the world don't wear sunscreen, and you don't see high incidence of skin cancer. That said, Bob Marley died of a melanoma. Did he really? Yeah. I didn't know so that. anyone can get one. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He got he one in his toenail, under his toenail, uh, because he was a Rastafarian, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore he couldn't go um, to, is it the afterlife? Or when he dies, he couldn't have any part of his body missing because they wanted to amputate his toe. So he said, no, you're not wow. taking my toe off because of my religion. Uh, so, he, so obviously the melanoma wasn't removed and he died from it. Wow. So yeah, so darker skin type, uh, less likely to get skin cancer anyway. Do you need to wear a sunscreen? Well, lots of people do anyway, just because of um, you don't want, you can still burn. Mm. It just take a lot longer to burn. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but you've mentioned things like psoriasis, hair loss, eczema. Yeah. Um, are you okay to talk through some of those yeah. things? Yeah. Um, so psoriasis, hair loss, and eczema. Then so. I don't know like, how, how much detail we want to get into with this, but I guess psoriasis and eczema. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, w in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, what, what, what are they and how can they be prevented? Okay, so um, what are they? What? They're, they're two different conditions. Yeah. They're scaly conditions. Mm -hmm. Psoriasis is uh, an autoimmune condition. Like your body is triggered off the rash through probably multiple reasons predisposed to it genetic predisposition environmental factors maybe an infection maybe some medicines you were given and you get psoriasis and that's these well circumscribed scaly typically not itchy bits of skin that will often form on the extensor surfaces so classically on the knees and the elbows around the belly button in the scalp and you can see it at any age but it can present um, in children uh, but you don't tend to see it later in life eczema on the other hand can present at any point in life and there's different types but the most common type we call atopic eczema and that is tends to be seen 
in association with things like hay fever and asthma. It's called that there's a triad, if you like, three conditions. That's exactly what I had. Yeah. Up until 10, I had extreme eczema on my, uh, all over my legs. Yeah. And so then I had asthma. And ch- and children are classic. And, and you grew out of it. Some don't they have it for life. That tends to be a very itchy rash. It forms off on the other side, usually on the, in the, in the fold of the skin. And it can form, uh, on the face, again on the scalp, but the big difference is what the eczema is usually very itchy. And again, it's a little bit. It is an. It is also thought to be an element of autoimmune or or or, or a problem with the proteins within the skin, a deficiency of a protein within the skin that holds the skin cells tight. And when that protein's missing, the skin gets dry. Dry skin gets itchy. You scratch, you rub, and then you get this eczema rash. <clears throat> so those are the two. That's the, and those are two of the big. Uh, conditions that we as dermatologists get referred as people with eczema psoriasis. Yeah, okay. Um, psoriasis, I thought, I, I was led to believe that um, sunlight and and yeah. being out of sun can support with that. It does that help right? it, yeah. So go on to the how you treat it. You, c- you can't cure these conditions. Okay. That's, that's the honest truth. But you can get rid of them. Yeah. Now, the way in which we approach the management is, is twofold, really. It's, it's how it affects you and it's how bad is it. Mm. Uh, because you can see someone covered in psoriasis it doesn't bother them at all so we don't need to necessarily medicalize that person whereas someone else might have two or three small patches but they don't want to go to the gym they don't want to go out it's really upsetting them so then we might need to be more aggressive if you like in our stance how much with that patient uh, so uh, it, but eczema on the other hand tends to be can wax and wane it can be there and it grow out of it it can disappear altogether and it can flare up or it can be there the whole time it's really weird you say that lives. I am um how mine went I went on holiday for two weeks yeah went in the sun quite a lot yeah and it cleared yeah. my eczema up yeah and it just never returned um, yeah that's, yeah that's kind of how it went I was like 13 I think. so that light therapy you were talking about light so sunshine is an immunosuppressant naturally immunosuppressant so it suppresses it shines on your skin it will push away these immune cells our lymphocytes from our skin and those cells are thought to always be driving these conditions so we use light therapy in the health service to treat these conditions <clears throat> not a sunbed looks like a sunbed it's a stand up sunbed if you like but it's a medical one that only emits a, a narrow wavelength of ultraviolet which we know is safe but will su- clear the skin in some people it doesn't work in everyone there's a lot of time involved you have to come up to the hospital two three times a week for 16 weeks and there's no guarantee as you go through that treatment and they ratchet up the the, the intensity of your treatment you're going to come out of it with clear skin <clears throat> but in some people it's life-changing to have a clear skin go away and it might need that psoriasis might come back but maybe not for a year or two they might have light treatment again with eczema it's the same they might break that what we call the itch scratch rub cycles can't stop scratching get the natural sunlight get the sunlight on there the, the what we call phototherapy and stop the skin from itching and being broken and settle it down but natural sunlight is a treatment and i can't prescribe a holiday to the south of france but in the summer when we have sun i do tell patients while you're waiting to be seen maybe pop out but don't go and use a sunbed on the high street <laughs> do go and get yeah. some natural sunshine so so if you've got one of those skin conditions that are highly irritable mm. and you're out in the sun should you put sunscreen on it you should still put sun cream on it yeah it will still help that condition mm. uh and we also be protecting you from sun damage yeah it's a good question psoriasis as well and mm. like you see people get it in their hair and stuff like that and mm. um someone down the gym was talking about the other day about certain shampoos and things mm. like that is it if you are suffering with psoriasis or anything any sort of skin condition in your scalp and you, you know you get a bit dandruff and this yeah. is it is it good to go and see a dermatologist and get the special shampoo because you see like yeah. anti-dandruff shampoos and really effectively that's all it is head and shoulders <laughs> head and shoulders <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's the start if you like those are all things that contain let's put a tar so tar has been used for a long time to treat these scaly skin conditions so yeah you, you go to first port would probably be the pharmacist and say can i buy a, a medical grade shampoo and uh, that might just have slightly more tar in um, or, or things that contain like coconut to help soften the scale so those things you can then usually just purchase mm-hmm. and then if necessary you could see a gp and they might give you a prescription shampoo bear in mind these shampoos aren't shampoos they're not cleaning your hair they're just the vehicle with the drug in to get into your scalp um, to soften the scale or remove the inflammation but often these things if they don't get better you end up getting referred and then we might use a tablet or an injectable drug to try and make it disappear or switch off that process but as soon as you stop those treatments it does come back (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. 
All right, perfect. And then uh, I guess finally, so so hair loss. I, I assume we're not talking about male pattern baldness. We're talking about alopecia. Um, yep. So alopecia is the medical word for hair loss, which the male pattern baldness is one. Okay. Um, and that is a problem for young men. Um, so I never, you know, I don't ignore that as a condition. I do see young men and young, especially women, losing their hair. Mm. Um, tends to be in a private practice than within the NHS. But within the NHS, yes, we'll see people who've lost their hair yeah. with the coin-shaped hair loss, or we'll alopecia areata, that might be one you're referring to, where they get the bold spots coming, usually with stress. Or they might find their hairs coming out in tufts um, for some unexplained reason and leaving this scarred bits in their hair. So, yeah, that's a, hair loss is a big part of our job as well. It's one of the more common referrals we'll see. Yeah, so, so I've, yeah, I've seen those types of alopecia. So Gary Tonin. Um, is a yeah. jiu-jitsu practitioner who's who's got it. Um, mm. I work with a, a guy actually who's got pretty severe alopecia. Mm. Um, and if anything, he's almost the reverse of that where he's got a couple of tufts left, but the rest of it's completely gone. Mm. Um, obviously eyebrows, yep. everything. He certainly isn't a stressed looking guy. No. Very, very, very relaxed if anything. So what, yeah. what other reasons then stress would cause that? So it's not just stress. It's again, it's one of these sort of like, we don't fully know, but it's going to be lots of things bit of genetics it is an autoimmune condition this term autoimmune is an umbrella term for most of medicine so it's your body's attacking itself manifesting in some kind of disease so in the hair it can attack the hair follicles and knock them out and you get the coin shaped bold spots or all your hair but it hasn't scarred them there is another type where it literally destroys the hair follicle and hair isn't toast it's never coming back so these are all autoimmune types of alopecia but he's probably got the more common type called alopecia areata where he's lost all of it and mm-hmm. uh, it was called totalis or universalis where you lose all your body hair and that isn't just stress but it would be bad made of bad luck a bit of genetics and this autoimmune condition they might have other autoimmune diseases so you can often get clusters might have things run in families but yeah and that happens and, and the hair, once you've lost a lot it's very unlikely the hair's going to come back and sadly we don't have very good treatments for that yeah um, otherwise, the, you know, we would be using them. But, you know, there is, is one to watch. There are drugs coming through in trial which are found to make his hair come back even after some time having lost it. But it's all very much in trial phase. Yeah, all right. And is that pretty much most of what you do then? So, so yeah, that's skin cancer, um, those conditions, hair loss. Skin cancer, that's 90% of what I do. Um, hair, people losing their hair the odd rashes people with skin infections eczema psoriasis acne is a big part of our job Um, and increasingly this as we were talking about earlier what we call teledermatology which is where you um, consult with a a patient remotely uh, and give advice remotely I thought you were literally referencing your TV show again (laughs) no yeah yeah. so yeah so yeah lots of um, teledermatology that's the that's the that's the way in which you communicate yeah Um, just going to deviate a little bit um, when you mention acne because our audience uh, are, are typically guys but they're a bit older mm. do you get a lot of like, adult acne is that much of a thing um, you do um, it's usually women um, yeah. I tend to see women get acne perfect skin yeah. they have a kid or they hit their 30s and bang they've suddenly got spots and they tend to go off and spend a lot of time researching stuff spending a lot of money on products trialling different over the counter remedies doing diet, exercise, but they've basically just got acne. Mm. Um, and by the time they come to see someone like me, they've spent a lot of money, they've done all their research and they're really gonna need something prescribed. Yeah. Um, and it's the same management as a teenager with acne, actually, there's no difference. So we use the same treatments. And if it's really bad, we might be looking at a drug called isotretinone, more commonly referred to as Roaccutane. Um, there's old, old fashioned blood pressure pills, one called spironolactone that we can use in these women. There's contraception pills. Mm. In men, in the, who get acne later in life that, that on, say, on their chest or back now that might be due to supplement use steroid use especially so anabolic steroid use will I, give was, you a, I was going to come on yeah. to that actually so if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're taking supplements not as supplements but steroids basically yeah. anabolic steroids you get acne um, and I've had a few patients come to see me and you know looking good big muscles covered in spots but they're not going to stop the roids yeah. and I'm like well <laughs> I can't get rid of those spots. Yeah, because it seems like back knee is quite yeah. common and prevalent with bodybuilders, isn't it? Yeah. Well, why is it the back so much? Yeah, well, it's going to be, isn't it, that occlusive environment, sweaty shirts, right. lying on the backs. Um, you know, you're blocking the hair follicles. So they may not have acne. They might have what's called folliculitis. So it's inflammation, itis being inflammation around hair follicles. 
and that's you get more painful spots mm. or they're blocking off their sweat glands so you get sweat rash people might call it prickly heat and that's where you've, you're sweating so much but you're wearing occlusive shirts that you're you're blocking the sweat duct which is literally a pipe coming through your skin to let you sweat out you can get blocked up with salt crystals and you'll know if you've got it because you'll be working out and you'll suddenly get this massive wave of prickling going down your back or across your chest in the last few minutes and that's the sweat duct sort of muscles trying to excrete it out it can't it's blocked and your back will get covered in red bumps all over like mm-hmm. florid so that's your um that's called a, that's, that's a miliara crystalline i had that called. when i was i was younger i used to train that um you had a lot when you were younger mate no what i did you, yeah yeah <laughs> no when i was about 18 19 i used to train and a couple of times i had that exact same feeling yeah. and i was like a bit freaked out by it it's common in the military and yeah i had yeah. it a few times but I never experienced it since mm-hmm. but it was it was a couple of times where i'd get this prickly heat yeah all over from me. sweating yeah. yeah like halfway from my work and i'd be like yeah, it's dying. Dying. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's you block your sweat. Yeah, so um, sit, sit in soldiers who wear body armor, you know, they're sweating and they can't get the sweat out, yeah. gym workers. But guys who work out a lot, you know, yeah, and, um, you know, you're wearing shirts probably, as you know, they're wicking sweat away, but as a consequence, they've wicked the sweat away from your skin, but then you can't get it out in a washing machine because it's designed to hold all the dirt if you like in there so you know, replace your, your clothing probably more often than you might. I mean, I've definitely got clothing that's older than my kids that are still when you put it on you start working out you're like can, can anyone else smell that you know, <laughs> probably think, got yeah it. you probably need to throw that one away <laughs> you know so replace clothing um uh, and then yeah it's hard though because you want to work out and you, but your back's gonna sweat a lot it's under a shirt you might be lying on it and you get these spots so you don't necessarily need to, you wouldn't want to be staying on any tablets for that it's just a matter of trying to get your back aired mm. you know um, uh, and if it does get painful and spotty, uh, and then you have to think is actually is there some infection or inflammation around the hair follicles? Do you need a? Uh, and that might be what we call your, people refer to as fungal acne. So that's yeasts on the skin, and that's when you get little whiteheads on the back. And then you can just get some antifungal shampoo from a chemist, Nizoral or Ketoconazole shampoo, and that gets rid of that usually. Also, in case it is infection and it's painful, then you might need to start on antibiotics when you need to see a GP. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah it's a common problem uh, but again it's just down to the envir- environment more yeah. than anything else yeah fascinating uh, have you got any more questions no for the doctor no, no. no. Yeah, so I've panicked everyone then no, no, no. honestly it's um, it's not all doom and gloom in my life honestly most yeah, of the time it's, 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 um, it's lots of reassurance and public health campaign really isn't it it's just about what, what you can do to yeah. stop yourself getting skin cancer but um, you know if you're ever worried let me know yeah do you want to um, do you want to sort of mention do you private practice as well did you say uh, so I do yeah where's that um, so I have a private practice uh, in uh, Truro at the Dutch hospital and I also work at the Wood Medi Spa near Oakhampton mm-hmm. which is a reasonably new private hospital opened around 18 months two years ago and it's sat in a, country, in a big country house and if you haven't heard of it or looked at it it's worth looking up just it's a stunning Does, uh, who, who, who's the doctor who runs that James, doctor? James McDermott we, we've, we've that was the guy I was on about what guy? to get on to the podcast okay that was the guy because uh, a couple of my clients um, have had some surgery oh, and yeah, different yeah. stuff done okay. by him yeah so James James is um, is prolific he's well, he's very well known yeah. his clinic well I don't want to tell you, give his backstory you can speak of his in fascinating stories a fascinating yeah, place I've heard so. a lot about him it's really random so I, I trained a lady called Helen who worked for him she was his uh, cosmetic yeah yeah, I knew Helen. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I, I trained yeah. Helen. I was Helen, Helen's PT yeah. for a few years. Yeah, um, and then one of my clients come to me, and she she had um, surgery by him. Yeah. Um, yeah, she had a lot of loose things <laughs> removed, and then I had another client. None of these people know each other. Yeah, <laughs> and then I've got another client now who's a, a goldsmith, and he, he he does well in that industry. And then he's friends with him. They, they, yeah, so they he, went to his he, garden party not too yeah, long ago. Yeah, or so, yeah. So, so James, would you should get you should get him on. He's a he's a great guy. He's he's he'll tell you lots of interesting stories. So he's a plastic surgeon, uh, true, uh, you know, uh, a, a true NHS trained plastic surgeon. There's lots of people out there saying they're plastic surgeons. I'm a Mohs surgeon, dermatologist, and you know, so I can do that facial reconstruction up to the point where a local anaesthetic can be tolerated. But if I'm, someone's got a big problem on their face. I can't necessarily do that for them. They might need to go and see someone like him. Although that's not what he does. He does the aesthetic stuff. So breast orgs, faceless, Ryan right noses, ears. But yeah, that's where my practice is. Mm. And, and this, if I was allowed to mention that, this is called Map, map My Mole. Um, so mapmymole.com. You can look it up. And anyone who's worried about a mole, they can go to that site 
download, it basically shows you where the app is, download the app from the App Store, start your submission, uh, then you'll have to pause, pay your money, because we need to get this to you, that gets posted, it should arrive the next day, and then you can complete your images. You can upload your images of the mole. That then gets through to a back up end of the app, if you like, someone like me, or one of the other and we look at it usually the same day, if not the day after, and write back to you and say, yes, this is okay, or this is what it is, or this is what needs to happen. Um, yeah, perfect. And yeah, that, that website, your Instagram, because people are going to definitely check that out. Yeah, like stomach yeah. it. Um, your private practice, we'll put all that down in the description, mate. Yeah, oh, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's been amazing. Dr. Nelson, thank you very much. No, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Yeah. It's been good fun.